So this is going to be a hard presentation because there's a lot of stuff I want to say and it's it's pretty usually pretty hard to shut me up. But the first thing, everybody should know it's Mark's birthday, so stop by and tell him happy birthday and get that out of the way. So the second thing is, the more I looked at this and the more talk there was of community with CFS, every, there are so many people who uh, contributed to this release. Um, there was funding from ESA. There actually was a little bit of funding from Canadian Space. Uh, MMS provided funding for the improvements. Um, there are a lot of people in here. Gadare, who's left already. Alan, there's a lot of people, a lot of people in here, a lot of students, uh, a lot of commercial users who provided stuff. So over the past few years, I've just done technical topic talks, and now I'm finally getting to do a roadmap type top roadmap type talk again. So we have branched 4.11. There's some administration on uh, we rehosted our servers a few years ago and we desperately want to clean up the FTP site. The branch has been pretty much frozen and uh, just bug fixes going in for two or three weeks now. The, uh, there was a presentation on symmetric multiprocessing and the ecosystem of tools, and that was in two presentations last year, so all of that stuff's in. This is gonna have present improvements that are already in, as well as what we hope to get changed, because you can't really plan for change when you're depending on a community, because as I joke, uh, a lot of it's volunteers and people doing what they want and the only way to get a real deadline is to pay for it because otherwise it's just going to happen when it happens. So we have things we'd like to have. Uh, we still are working on our hosting and improving the infrastructure and we've got a really cool, what I hope everybody thinks is as nice an announcement is, uh, from the project standpoint as I think it is. So I've already said we've been, um, cut the release, all of that. 4.12, I've told a lot of people, we have grown to the point where uh, there are we have BSP families and specific BSPs. We have 96 BSP families and like 195 individual BSPs. Some of those have long outlived their usefulness. The actual original Artem's BSP from 1989 is still in the tree. Some other stuff has been removed, but we need to shoot some, shoot some dead, kill some zombies, and reduce the, the number of configurations. 4.12 is also going to be the last major release to use the GNU Auto tools. We are switching to a Python-based build system called WAF. It will take a normal build with all the tests on a, from, depending on your machine, from let's call it 12 to 15 minutes. You can build off all the code after Git clone in 60 seconds on a fast machine. That is an enabler for our infrastructure, which is to, uh, we've got a build bot installation that's ready to come online as soon as the new faster build system's in order, because if it takes you 20 minutes to build something, you don't want to be building 196 BSPs every time something gets committed. So there's a lot of things that are just kind of queued behind improving the build time. So this is a, going to be a big change. But the, 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 after we get past 4.12, we are going to, we probably should have already changed to 5 when the symmetric multiprocessing went in, but we were too committed to 4.11 to change. So we're going to, once we get to the, 5.0 will be the first release from, um, build system, and Amar Takar has been working diligently on this. He has come over and helped us from the network time protocol. We also have, and I can't remember his name, the person who developed WAF from the uh, Samba project has also been making improvements to WAF for us and helping us get the build system in, so this is really helpful. Our plan is basically to create a development branch which will keep the auto tools going and let people make changes in case they're going to be bound and blocked by the build system. But the intent is that we're going to push the WAF build system to the master and plow through as fast as we can, making sure that the WAF build system works and that we check the executables against the old build system. So this should allow us to build both systems in parallel, keep the source in sync, and make sure the executables match and all the objects match at the end. Uh, BuildBot is a continuous integration system. After that's online, we'll have Fabricator, which allows you to do uh, patch submission via the web and allow reviews and uh, tracking system online. And if everything works as it's supposed to, no one will see your uh, code until it's already been through an automated build sweep. So hopefully this will improve the quality and reduce the load on all the core developers. So the Long-term plan is, uh, I've told a lot of people, we've got the RTIMS source builder, which anybody who's built RTIMS recently knows you use the script to build the tools. It fetches them, patches them, builds them for you. It takes usually no more than 20 minutes. Uh, Alan has actually used it on a Raspberry Pi to build a Spark tool set, which must have been fun to watch. And uh, 
So what we're hoping to do is, uh, the plan is after we get over testing RTEMs, we're gonna start building third party packages. So one of the things the RTEM source builder can do is all these add-on packages that are interesting, like uh, there's graphics packages, NTP, SNMP, um, someone mentioned Pro Google's protocol buffer code has actually already got a package. So we're gonna try to start turning on testing all of these packages as, we've, uh, as things come online. So all our goal is to publish all testing results. And so the entire suite of our Tims and tools, our intent is that we will be publishing test results regularly as a community, and then you'll be able to completely duplicate those results, including our coverage testing. So that should all be very good. The last thing is, it seems like everybody is going to a two digit version system. So after the 4.11 and 4.12 series, that'll be the end of the three digit series. So I guess our numbers will be climbing higher. Because the same argument, when do you change four? You don't know, you just never change it. It's the same thing CFS is talking about, where you just keep incrementing until you get a thousand so you don't have to go through the process. But that's kind of what we're doing. So the numbering past five is basically gonna be like GCC, where the basically you're just dropping off the first digit. And this is how GCC is numbered now. So this is not a huge change, but it'll, it'll confuse me for a long time. So the 4.11 features that are already in, these are on the release branch. Uh, bless you, the Spark is uh, the Leon 3, the NGMP is, works very well up to four cores. The PowerPC has been tested up to 24 cores on the QRIQ. The ARM Zinc, the Cyclone 5, and the ARM reference board, the RealView, all have SMP working on it. Um, the x86, uh, there's a context switch uh, handoff synchronization algorithm and uh, all other architectures got, got it updated when that change was made and nobody's wanted to touch the x86 assembly. It probably won't take long if somebody's willing to touch about 20 lines of assembly code, but so far nobody's really felt like they wanted to do it. I was really surprised when I started making the list of um, architecture ports. There are what, six new architectures now and those six architectures added 12 new BSPs. The JFFS2 was merged, a port, dynamic loading, there's a uh, capture trace engine was enhanced for SMP. Uh, one of the things uh, Marco and kind of challenged me to do on one of the telecons, he goes, can you, why don't you add more warnings and get rid of all the warnings? So I think other than nothing but a personal challenge, I think I eliminated uh, uh, probably close to 2000 warnings and BSPs and device drivers just sweeping through and use the warnings he suggested. So the, the only warnings really left are either GCC bugs uh, or code from like the networking code, which is actually third party code, which we're not gonna change. So the other file system, uh, YAFS, yet another file system, is uh, not merged because it's dual licensed, but it's also had a port. The SMP from the earlier slides, it does have uh, two SMP out scheduling algorithms. One does not have processor affinity or thread pinning where you can uh, lock a thread onto a particular core, even in a single scheduler. The other scheduler just floats threads across the cores that are available, and there is partition scheduling on top of that, so you can run a uniprocessor schedule. Uh, you can run mix of uniprocessor and multiprocessor schedules in a system. It's beautiful because you guys sponsored both teams, and we had, di we had totally different ideas on how to solve the problem, and in the end, we kind of covered a lot of the entire space of the solution space. This one also surprised me, and, and so now I say we have 195, 96 BSPs. These are only the BSPs added to existing ports. And uh, a lot of these, as you can tell, looking at like uh, the ARM, you can see that there are variations on, within a family, like the LPC, the Cyclone V, uh, the Spark had the NGMP added. So there were a lot of new BSPs, um, but a lot of them are only variations. So. Uh, the tool versions were updated to more recent versions. These are all pretty new. Um, some of the ports may be using alternate versions and have patches, but this is the nominal tool set for all of the, all of the targets for uh, 4.11. Uh, this is a slide I, th I think I used last year. The idea was just to show the things that are now in our uh, tool ecosystem and remind that you're a user of the tools, the developers are a user, and the continuous integration is a user of the tool. So we need GUI and command line interface from the top down. Um, I think most people have seen the source builder at least to build the tools. 
There's an RTIMS tester. For, uh, these, these, most of these tools on the host side are written in Python. The tester can run uh, simulators or drive uh, JTAG debuggers through uh, the GDB machine interface. Um, when it's running simulators, it can run one instance per core on your host machine. So if you've got a mul huge multi-core machine, I mean, we've got one machine, I think we can run like 20 instances of simulators in parallel. So the testing time can go way down using the testing framework. The RTIMS loader is the, uh, the host side of doing the dynamic linking which was added, which follows the POSIX model. Uh, the RTIMS trace linker generates uh, trace wrappers for anything you want to. The trace wrappers are generated from a template, so if you want to write your own trace functions, that wrap any function and log it. They, it's right there. You can generate your own um, your own trace linkers, or you can use the ones for the format that use the RTIMS capture engine. The capture trace is on the host. I mean, the target side. This was enhanced to be SMP safe, which turned out to be, as most things, SMP at the application level is harder than you think it is. But uh, last year, I had a trace of the timeline of a quad core system coming up, creating tasks. And it literally shows you with the nanosecond cycle accurate counter that things don't happen in the order you think they happen in. So you can see things running before you think they would have run and on different cores. The last is something that has been a continuous project for over five years is we are continually trying to improve the coverage testing and the reporting. And uh, there's some stuff about to be merged from a student which will change our reporting to being based essentially on a directory by directory basis. Because what I realized is every time we added more code to report, our giant our percentage went from like 99.9 .9 to like 50 to 60 or something because we'd add a huge block of code. Well, that didn't mean that the whole coverage got worse. It meant we'd like in this case added the DOS file system or doubled the amount of code we wanted to measure, and then the overall percentage will look horrible. And it, it's mostly a um, from a management per, in perspective. I just hated seeing the coverage number drop when it really didn't drop. The Tool status, I just went over that. So 4.11 was kind of frozen a little bit back and then before the branch was cut, it went, it uh, became slushy. So there was a little bit of work backed up. One of the things that happened was uh, the SMP got, uh, we added a lightweight IP API that basically is used by language runtimes and uh, infrastructure, which is much, which is as light as it can possibly be. And the idea here is that this is used by the GCC language runtimes. So C, GCC with the C11, C++11, and C++14 support as it is, already supports the threads and all the atomics and all the basic operations that are in those languages in the GCC uh, libraries. The other thing that happened here is, so 4.11 was heavily exercised on up to quad cores, but every OS has had this general evolution from one to two to four to eight to some point where the algorithms fell over on themselves. So uh, Embedded Brains pushed it up to 24 cores on a Q or IQ. There's a ticket with uh, a log, like a, almost like a development blog on how it was done. So it's interesting to see how this happened. Basically, there was uh, some GCC optimizations themselves where they were using malloking and freeing a lot. And all it was was they optimized it themselves. So if you, um, you look, uh, I think the runtime is how much can you get done, but a lot of the things went halved or went farther down. But the one that's really impressive is the things that Embedded Brains did to focus on using the new lightweight API on a 24 core system. And if you notice using pthreads versus using the new lightweight API, basically the tests are 10 to 100 times faster. And the benchmark went from showing the locking as the main CPU use to, there, I think there's nothing there's no idle time, and there's basically nothing from RTIMS and the top 10 CPU consumers on the OpenMP benchmark. I should say this is OpenMP. The MPI works well too. So the SMP is coming is very, appears to be very stable, but to take good air's warning, we haven't seen it in a production system, so we always hold back on our cautious note until somebody gets through a flight qual. So I've mentioned the goals for 4.11, 4.12. It's things that will happen plus some things that are planned. The obsolete ports and obsolete BSPs is the primary goal. Uh, things will happen as they come along. Isaac, some, somewhere sitting over there, has, are, is on the verge of submitting uh, 
what will probably be a set a BSP that can be easily adapted to any ST microelectronics ARM processor because he's ported the HAL their HAL abstraction layer in and based the BSP on it. Um, I did the bottom of that was if you care about a BSP, make sure we know about it because when we're starting to ask questions, people need to say keep it because I, I think I know all the space qualified BSPs and the Beagle and the Pi Raspberry Pi aren't going anywhere, but there's some others, like I've talked to people about the Mongoose, and I think it's kind of going out the door. So the 5.0 chain goals are to get us to the WAF build system. And unfortunately, our TIMS will use CVS for a long time, and we tried to avoid um, moving things around. So we'll try not to reorganize things. That's the minimum goals. But we ultimately want to reorganize things so the source is a little better organized and easier to track through. And Hopefully we will have time to or get help to convert the documentation to something more modern than GNU Tech Info, which I actually converted the previous documentation to like in 1994 or 1995. So um, WAF is in Python. I mentioned the timing. There's a link to the times. The desirable changes. This is a list of things if somebody works on, we'd really like. Um, so. We want to make sure that the R RSB can build all the third-party packages. This will really clean up some stuff. One of the long-term goals is to move the current network stack into its own build system. So RTEMS itself would be built without a networking stack. Then you would have a choice between the old IPv4 only, the lightweight IP, or the new BSD stack, which uh, is running full gig E on ARM Zinc and PowerPC QRIQ. And we've had it in the lab on a PC. Um, some other things, there's a couple of, the Pi 2, we'd like to see the SMP working, a GSOC student didn't finish it, and we'd, that x86 uh, needs that work. So one of the things we've done and is worked a lot on updating our infrastructure, so we're now, we've been hosted a couple of years at Oregon State's Open Source Lab, and they're probably, there are still broken URLs because we went from one host to multiple hosts. We switched from to track and and um, and get, and that's kind of like C, CFS. And the more we build, the more hardware we'll need. Um, eventually, we I mean we're going to have to have a Mac for testing as a host, and that's one of the things that has to come in. So this is this has all been done as volunteer effort, which is why it's taken so long. So what we really I've mentioned Fabricator and Buildbot and database. And so basically our goal is to anything a computer can help with, we want a computer to do. Um, one of our GSOC projects this year might be interesting to you guys. So it, a lot of boards use U-Boot, which is GPL v3. We are starting to get negative comments from uh, a lot of corporate users on having anything with GPL v3 anywhere near their target hardware and shipping things because of the uh, patent restrictions and the TiVo things there it's a that's why Apple has uh, switched to LLVM and other things and from GCC micro monitor is a mature project that was uh, originally developed by Ed Sutter well it still is developed by Ed Sutter at AT&T Lucent Bell Labs it's got a long history with our Tim's we uh, talked to Ed he was in the process of he had gotten approval from AT&T Lucent legal to relicense to Apache and we approached him at the same time and the core of the code and some and, and be revisiting all of the ports to see which ones are current is now at um, at artems.org. So it's kind of an artems sub project. This gives you a non GPL boot monitor that is capable of doing network boots, all the core things you need from a boot monitor, but it doesn't. It's not GPL. So if you're concerned about that, and it's working on the Beagle now, and so as the code comes over, we'll. If people are interested, we'll look at the old ports that he has. He had a 30 or 40 uh, boards supported, and so it'll be a nice thing to see come over. So this, there were supposed to be two announcements, but I couldn't. the second one didn't come through in time. The big announcement is that we've been talking to um, the Software Freedom Legal uh, Center, and they're the ones who've done all the legal paperwork for the Apache Foundation and the Free Software Foundation. And we are trying, we're in the process, we hope, I don't know how long it'll take, we're going to set up a not-for-profit to be a foundation for our TIMS going forward. Um, the, the paperwork is just starting on that. Um, it took a while to get the 
the they, them to agree to be our our lawyers to do this. They are the in the U.S. I think they are maybe the only ones who have ever gotten a software foundation through an IRS review. So we're they they're hard to get through. So we're hopeful, but we wanted a legal home for our Tims that was more independent of everyone. So it will li have a long life. The other thing is. A long, long time ago, Mark and a couple others and, and myself, we argued whether we should use GPL B2 plus exception or a BSD license. And at the time, we felt like we needed a stick to encourage submissions. Well, now it's turned out that I think we've done a pretty good job of convincing people it's in their best interest to submit code just because it's the right thing to do to keep moving forward. Um, open source and free software has come a long time in, in, vis in um, visibility and understanding. And the worst thing is that the GPL v3 has made a lot of people leery of anything with the GPL in any version. And a lot of, uh, we're seeing feedback that people won't discuss using RTEMS because of the GPL. So we feel like we did it from, from a practical basis. Philosophically, we don't see from our use, there's no difference on what it obligates you as an end user to do. We just think it makes it easier to understand. So. What we're, we believe now we have a strong community that we have taught everybody the business value of sharing and submitting. So we think we've sold the carrot. And um, so the process of doing this, and this is part of what's going to have to be legally vetted, we're going to need to get permission from everybody who's contributed. So deleting old code actually helps because we don't have to find people we haven't heard from in a long time. So there is an advantage, two advantages to doing this. The other thing is... Um, well, the, we want the form legally vetted. We want to know that the process of getting the permission is legally acceptable. And then basically, logically, the permission is nothing more than going over the entire revision history of the file and uh, looking for email addresses in the headers where somebody might have not actually made it into a log. And when everybody has given permission, then the file on a file by file basis will be relicensed. So we'll make some effort to locate the missing uh, the good news is the top contributors, probably the top 15 to 20 contributors, are on board doing this. OAR, Embedded Brains, Gadare, uh, Chris Johns, who's contributed since like 1991, is on board. Um, so we think we can account for all of the core of our Tim's pretty easily. So this should be should be okay until you get down into BSPs where we are going to have trouble finding people. That's where we think the biggest problem is going to be. So basically, we just want to do our due diligence to ask permission and be diligent and make sure our process is okay for making sure we do the right thing because we only get one chance to do this right and one chance to do it wrong and suffer from it forever. So we want to do it right. Um, the reality is, is there may be some files which we can't ever relicense, and we'll just have to accept that. Some came from third-party projects, and we will not relicense them. If it's in a critical area and somebody cares, then we can write, we can do a replacement if, of somebody's code. This has happened on other projects and with this, during this process. And we will try to obsolete stuff more aggressively on technical terms. We're discussing uh, a tiering system of tier one, two, and three BSPs and architectures, and this will allow us to tier things out in a more rational fashion. Then we've been very lenient about leaving things in. The other thing, and I mentioned this on the, I think on the CFS day, there's an SPDX. Um, that allows you to do standard annotation for open source licenses. You just put a tag in the header file, I mean in the top comment block, and there are tools that some plug into Eclipse, some are standalone. They can analyze an entire source tree and generate a report of all the open source licenses under the tree. We're going to integrate this into our build system. It's because for us, with 20, let's say 20 architectures and 200 BSPs, all of those licenses don't apply to you. So if you build, say, Spark, you're pretty much only going to hit the core RTEMS code, um, OAR, Embedded Brains, and, and Gaisler. And you're, only going to hit, you're not going to hit much more than beyond that. But if you go off into, say, the PC, you're going to hit a completely different set of, of, of people who contributed to that. This annotation helps. Um, and there are some companies out there that do analysis based on this. But the idea is this is standard annotation. Um, every o open source initiative open source license has got a tag, even the NASA license. So, you know, it's pretty good. 
So we're this is we think this is worth doing, and we're actually considering. Gadair and I've talked about using it as a Google coding task uh, for uh, to have students mark it up because the licenses are pretty easy to identify, and then we would review if they got it right. This should help people moving forward to ensure they uh, are fault know what the licenses are. So we're really trying to evolve. Everything is driven by user feedback. We're always trying to improve our processes. Um, and honestly, if it wasn't for community, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have any of these improvements. Um, there's, I couldn't begin to list how many people have contributed between 4.10 and to make that 4.11 release um, happen. So I'm ready for questions. That was a, a lot. I, I felt like this is a hard present. There's a lot to cover. <laughs> Before we get to questions, let me point something out. Uh, first, happy birthday, Mark. <laughs> um, I, they're incredibly responsive. Uh, about a year ago, I said, I, I want to give away Beagle Bones. And they said, oh, we haven't finished testing Artems on it. And they called me back the next day and goes, okay, we're done. So <laughs> in, just incredibly responsive. Questions? I'm always walking the mic over. I left out somebody else important. Ben Groff from the who had worked for years for the Menix project, uh, came over and has been working on RTEMS, and he's the one who did the Beagle because he did all the Menix arm support. <coughs> and um, so we're, I, I desperately didn't want to see him leave the free OS community, so I just kind of begged on him until he came over and worked on RTEMS. So. <laughs> I just want to point it out that when uh, FreeBSD went to version 4.11, they put out a Spinal Tap fake t-shirt that says ours goes up to 11. Oh. <laughs> Oh, a t-shirt idea. We're really poor on those, so that would be really good. We need some new stickers and t-shirts. Once you have the foundation, I'm sure there will be t-shirts available right next to the PayPal button. <laughs> Questions? Oh, could you pass that forward? When do you expect the version 5 to come out with Wave? The, the actual, the dot zero release? Mm -hmm. The pending thing is an FTP site cleanup, and I guess I'm going to beat on the guy next week because I think it should happen, even if we need to just sit down. So we're going to meet in San Jose for the Google Summer Code Mentor Summit next week, and maybe I can just make him do it while we sit there. Because <laughs> I think he's just scared of doing something on the FTP site that he doesn't have a proof that we don't all buy into. So I think we have three or four people who are in the area who can come help review that and make sure because it needs to be done. It's ready to go. It's been hammered on a lot. And, I mean, Airbus slash EAD slash Astrium really beat on the SMP, and so did Spacebell, and uh, the PowerPC stuff was beaten on a lot by Embedded Brains. Okay, other questions? Nope. Thank you, Joel. <laughs>